How does someone become known as the greatest knight of the Middle Ages? Find out as Footnoting History takes you through the life of one man who has been given that title, William Marshall. Hey everyone, Christine here with Kristen to talk to you about the most fabulous knight to ever live. And yes, we know someone out there somewhere probably has another knight they'd like to put up for that title. And that's great! But we have elected William Marshall to it here. It's so true. We are really excited to talk about him today. And we're going to handle it a little differently than other episodes. Instead of being a strict biography, even though you'll get things in chronological order, We're going to talk about him by emphasizing what we think were the most interesting aspects of his life. And by the end of our next episode, you will totally still feel like you've gotten the full picture of this fabulous man. To give you a very quick grounding in where we are in time and region, William Marshall lived from roughly 1146-1147 to 1219, and he spent most of it but as we'll see, not all of it, in Western Europe. And during his 70 plus years of life, he witnessed so many major things and dealt with so many high placed people that I will never stop being in awe of it all. Really, these episodes are going to be full of those moments where you say to yourself, he did that too? (laughs) And yes, the answer is always yes. Before we start, we want to send lots of love to our patrons. You keep us running and we really mean it that we could not do this without you. We really couldn't. You are how we cover the podcast's running costs. And if anyone else is able to help support the work we do here at Footnoting History, there are perks and you can visit patreon.com slash footnoting underscore history to find out what they are and what level best suits your life. Also, just a reminder to everyone that this episode is available with captions at youtube.com slash footnotinghistory and footnotinghistory.com. Please visit us there and like and subscribe. Yes, that is so important. Also important is us starting this episode. (laughs) Regular listeners and or fans of medieval history are probably aware that it is pretty common for there to be a severe lack of sources about people from the Middle Ages. That's why in our episodes on topics like Licoritia of Winchester and Anne Neville, we have to say, we think, or we don't know, when it comes up to gaps in the narrative. However, with William Marshall, that isn't the case. So why don't you kick us off, Kristen, with the first cool thing about William Marshall from our list, since it tells us why we know so much about him. So I really always like to ask how we know what we know as historians. It's maybe not something that people automatically think about as exciting when talking about an historical event or a person, but it is really exciting. And I'll tell you why. Because a lot of what we know or what we think we know is based on material that is biased. William Marshall is like the Forrest Gump of the 12th slash early 13th century England. Like, he's just everywhere in the Civil War, in the tournament scene, in the courts of kings. He's involved in Magna Carta. He's just everywhere. And so to that end, there are a lot of things that mention him, but William Marshall has himself the earliest surviving biography of a medieval European knight. I love biographies so much. Same. It is considered the first biography of a layperson in medieval Europe, meaning someone who had not taken holy orders and entered into the formal hierarchy of the church. And it's written sometime after 1229 in Anglo-Norman, which was a vernacular language of the upper classes of this era of English history. And so not in Latin. We do not know exactly who wrote the history of William Marshall, but historians think that it was someone who knew William in life, The author names himself as John in the epilogue, but that is not terribly specific. And he says that he was at a lot of the events that are described. The person who paid for this work to be written was William's eldest son, also named William. 
So there is a lot of family legacy at stake here. The whole thing is just one long love letter to show how awesome William Marshall was, how honorable he was, what a good knight he was, how brave he was, what a good job he always did, you know, stuff like that. And so to that end, the history of William Marshall is often labeled as propaganda. So you do have to consider that when you're reading it. You definitely always have to be aware of bias. But I mean, I guess we can at least say William probably wasn't a total monster to his family. Because if he was, maybe his son wouldn't have invested in this major work. He might have been like, forget this guy. (laughs) Yeah, right. I mean, also, there's just a lot of detail in here. And you really do kind of get it all. The childhood years, the formative night years that I'm sure in the William Marshall movie would have an overlay of music montage with him learning how to use a sword. And can't you (laughs) just picture it? (laughs) And then you get like his prime years and then the golden ones. It really takes the the full arc. We are actually going to get to William Marshall in movies next time. Because I love that Yes, that is right. We are. So stay tuned for that. In the history, though, there's color about like castle life, politics, treachery and triumph. It's kind of great if you're looking for what the 13th century ideal for knighthood was and information about what life was like. Can you trust it all? Absolutely not. But you can use it in conjunction with other, dare I say, more boring source materials. It's a great story. And a lot of the broad strokes do check out. I've included Nigel Bryant's 2016 translation in the further reading for the episode. But if you're feeling really ambitious, the Anglo-Norman Society has also published a version that you can read in the original language. We also have several great William Marshall modern biographies in that further reading list for you to check out. And uh, as we jump into the actual events of William's life, you'll see exactly what we mean when we say he was everywhere and at so many major events. In fact... There is an extraordinary story about him that comes from his childhood. It's so interesting that Kristen and I both like it so much and that we basically flipped a coin, not not literally, <laughs> to decide who got to talk about it. Kristen won. It's okay. I'm over it. But it is our number two. Cool point about William Marshall, his childhood near-death experience. And really, I mean that. He almost died. And it was because of his father, John Marshall, participating in the big English power struggle of the mid-12th century, the anarchy. Yes. In the first section of the biography called Marshall's Father, we hear about Sir John the Marshall. He was a knight fighting on the side of the Empress Matilda in the Civil War with King Stephen that Christine just rightly called the anarchy because there was a serious breakdown in the order and function of things. Uh, Regular listeners of Footnoting History will have heard about Matilda in several of my episodes about King Henry II because she eventually became his mom through her second marriage. Matilda gets called Empress because it was her title of choice, since from a young age she was betrothed to the Holy Roman Emperor, who she eventually married as her first husband and then became the widow of. She was also royal in another way. She was the only living, legitimate child of King Henry I of England. She became that only living, legitimate child after her brother, the expected heir to the throne, died in the white ship incident that Christine talks about in depth in her episode on Henry I and the white ship. The white ship is seriously one of the best medieval stories. And if you haven't listened, do yourself a favor and go listen. Thank you. But yes, that's Matilda. And one day I will do a full episode on her too. I feel like that's all I do is cover that time period because I love it. Now, as you probably guessed, the anarchy began because, well, even though Henry I had backed Matilda as his heir, when he died in 1135, the crown didn't go to her. It was taken by her cousin Stephen. And seeing as Stephen is the only King Stephen in English or British history, you can guess how that ultimately went. But at the time, it was a serious conflict, and one which William Marshall got caught up in thanks to his dad. The author of The History of William Marshall is very clear that Matilda was the, quote, rightful heir to the crown. That's 
literally what it says. I realize we keep saying Willie Marshall and John Marshall, like Marshall is their last name in a modern sense. The Marshall was a job title of sorts. The full title was Marshall of the Horses, and I love that. And it was a military leadership sort of role. So that person was the keeper of the royal horses or the household troops. But anyway, William Marshall's father, Sir John, was on the good guy side, aka Miltobos side, but he was also kind of a schmuck. In 1152, Stephen, the usurper king, laid siege to a fortified outpost under John Marshall's command at Newbury. Newbury was not prepared for them, requested a truce, and John Marshall asked for some time to let Matilda know the terms. In the meantime, his second son, the approximately five-year-old William, would be given to Stephen as a hostage. Stuff like this is pretty common in medieval warfare. It seems kind of cold, but if you respected the terms of the ceasefire truce, then it would probably be fine. William's father did not do that and used the pause to reprovision Newbury, and Stephen was pissed. He told John Marshall that he was going to hang his son William in retaliation, and John Marshall apparently said, No problem, pal. Quote, He didn't care about the child, for he still had the anvils and the hammers to forge yet better ones. What a guy. Basically, whatever. I'll just make another one. (laughs) Stephen called the bluff, sort of. He ordered William to be hanged, and they made the gibbet, and they were walking William to it, but William had no clue what was going on. He's a really young kid. And on the way, he was really excited about his armed escort's super cool javelin and was like, cool, cool, can I play with it? Can I play? My paraphrase, but that's basically it. And Stephen was just like, can't do it. He was overwhelmed with, quote, warm compassion at William's, quote, innocent glee. And he picked him up and took him away. This all honestly makes Stephen sound pretty nice to me, which is a little at odds with how hands down supportive the author is of Matilda. But I guess the person who commissioned all this was William's son. So he probably was a little grateful to Stephen for how this all played out. I've always felt that like in many ways, Stephen was a nice enough guy, but also was just a terrible king. Yes. Yeah. In this case, I love him a lot because if he had killed little William, we wouldn't be talking about him today. History might be quite different, but luckily for us, William did get returned to his family and survived to adulthood, which brings us to our next exciting aspect of his life. William becomes a tournament winning legend. When he was about 12, William was sent to his uncle in Normandy, where he became a squire and started his formal training as a knight. Apparently, he spent eight years drinking and eating and sleeping, which sounds pretty good to me. He got the nickname William Waste of Food because he was a waste of resources, and the other squires talked about him behind his back and were like, who even is this guy? He's just useless. (laughs) <laughs> and this is even like a translation thing too. Like you'll hear it translated as different things in different places because some places make the modern English of his nickname the glutton. Like, okay. But ultimately the meaning is pretty much the same. It's just different ways of saying it. It's kind of cool that way. Yes. And despite it, William grew into a fine specimen of a man who was, quote, created perfect in every limb. And the author says that he saw with his own eyes all of this. So William was hot. He had the, quote, bearing of an emperor. He was tall with brown hair and a, quote, good and swarthy complexion. He's just the physical embodiment of medieval European nobility, you know, which is handy because that's what he goes on to become. William was knighted at age 19 or 20 right on schedule, and his first outing as a knight, which involved helping defend an English-controlled city in Normandy from French encroachment, was a wild success. But knighthood didn't remotely mean that William was set for life. That squire training that William received was essentially one long unpaid internship that he got because of family connections. 
But significantly, William was not the heir of his family. That was his elder brother, John. So he was not going to inherit anything he could live on when his father died. And so he had to sort himself out. And as we said, the way that he did that was through making money on the tournament scene. And what's more medievally ubiquitous than knights at a tournament? For real. Now, when we mention a tournament, you might immediately imagine a joust, the really dramatic charging of two knights on horseback with their lances down the lists that was just excellent for medieval spectators and modern movies. Actually, one was just recently in House of Dragons, but that wasn't the core of the tournaments when William was making money from them. His golden goose was the melee. The melee was basically a gigantic fight where knights just went at it and they kind of like picked one another off or captured each other until eventually there was a winner. All that really separated this from actual warfare was the constraint against killing. And the point of it all for the knights was the money and the glory, but mostly the money. Mm -hmm. The prisoners the knights captured could be held for ransom. And if you couldn't pay the ransom, the capturing knight got all your stuff all your expensive equipment, and your whores. William Marshall cleaned up on the tournament circuit. He was really good at capturing his opponent's horses' reins and leading them off the field. On his deathbed, he estimated that he did this at least 500 times. That's probably an exaggeration, but suffice it to say, he did a lot. Allegedly, one time he won the whole tournament and they couldn't find him to give him the prize. And they finally tracked him down at a forge where his head was down on the anvil and the blacksmith was pounding him out of his helmet because it got smashed onto his head and he couldn't get out. A lot of things compete in my head for best William moment, but that's definitely top five for me. It's sort of fabulous that anecdotes like that, which I mean are more humorous than glory making, have made that down to us today like even if they're only alleged like they could have happened which is kind of great and actually William's tournament glory play a part in our next big William Marshall topic the fact that he served a queen and five yes five crowned English kings which is a lot of royalty a lot a lot By the time William was making his name in the tournament world, the anarchy had ended. King Stephen died back in 1154, and the rightful order of succession was restored. Although Empress Matilda never became proper Queen of England, not too long before Stephen passed, he agreed that her son Henry would have the crown next. So by this point in William's life, King Henry II was on the throne, And William may have been born a not-rich second son, but he would become a major associate of Henry II and his family. How this happened is dramatic in itself. If there's one thing you take away from this episode, it should be that William's life was extraordinarily dramatic. Absolutely. In the late 1160s, during his tournament time period, William went into the service of his uncle, the Earl of Salisbury. That uncle was an associate of Eleanor of Aquitaine, Henry II's queen, and tasked with helping her maintain Poitou, a region of what is now modern France, but at this time belonged to her and was therefore an extension of the English crown. Unfortunately, William and his uncle, among others, got caught up in an ambush with members of the prominent French family the Lusignans, who wanted to get their hands on Queen Eleanor. In the process, William's uncle was assassinated, and William himself sustained a thigh injury and was placed in captivity by the Lusignan until Queen Eleanor paid for his release and took him into her household retinue. This was the start of William's close affiliation with the royal family, and it was one that would last the rest of his life. William started off with Queen Eleanor, but by the time he passed away in 1219, he would also serve her husband, King Henry II, three of their children who were crowned king, Henry the Young King, Richard I, a.k.a. Lionheart, and John, as well as John's son, King Henry III. That was a remarkably long run of royal service. It really was, and it wasn't all roses and sunbeams either. In 1170, Henry II had his eldest son crowned king, and he is the one that we know as Henry the Young King. Henry II did this because he knew all too well what his mother went through and felt that he had to secure the succession as much as possible, 
which he sought to do by having the coronation held for the young king while he was still ruling. The young king is one of my all-time favorite historical people, and I did a whole episode about him a few years ago, which, if you haven't heard it, might be of interest to you after listening to this. I remember when I was making that episode, I wasn't sure how much to talk about William Marshall in it because we had time constraints and I wanted to save him for another possible episode on his own, but I wasn't sure if I actually did that, so I went back and checked. (laughs) And you will find, if you listen, that William only receives like a brief mention, so here you will get more. Good job, past you, saving it for now. I guess past me really knew what was coming. I don't know. (laughs) Anyway, uh, following the young king's coronation in 1170, William was transferred into the young king's household. He was about 10 years older than the young king and took on a tutor-like role and bonded with him over their shared love of participating in tournaments. Although historian David Crouch once worded it as, quote, infected the boy with his own love of the tournament, (laughs) which for some reason entertained me. However it exactly happened, though, William and the young king became buddies, and William was tasked with keeping everything sorted out for the young king regarding his entourage. One of my favorite fun facts about William and the young king, which ties us back to Kristen's tournament talk, is that they participated in a really big one together at the tail end of the 1170s that occurred incredibly close to or some say actually partially on, a field that is now under Disneyland Paris. If you think I didn't point that out to my mother when we went to Disneyland Paris, you don't know me. I would be disappointed if you didn't do that, to be honest. And I hope you told random people nearby this fun fact, too. I should have. I need a t-shirt with it on it next time. But I digress. In this time period, we start to see that William's loyalty to whoever he is tasked with serving was usually unflappable, even when the young king rebelled against his father, Henry II, because he was unhappy being a crowned king who had no real power, William stayed with him. Not everyone liked how close they were, and Kristen can back me up on this, sometimes being a royal favorite isn't all it's cracked up to be because others hate you. Our hero does, in fact, face obstacles, and he's not perfect, which Mm -hmm. makes me like him even more, to be honest. I do love a good, fallible hero. Yes. By 1182, the friendship had some issues, namely that William was too self-important when it came to those money-making tournaments, which didn't seem as deferential to the young king as he would have liked. Those who wanted to be close to the young king no doubt found glee in this conflict and were also the likely cause of gossip, and it was likely just that gossip that William tried to, or succeeded in, having an affair with the young king's wife. Despite the estrangement this caused, William was back at the young king's side after what amounted to roughly a year. The only problem with this was, and they couldn't have known it at the time, that the young king was once again at odds with his father. And by at odds, Christine means once again, he was in open rebellion due to his unhappiness at being kept waiting to be important. And he was estranged from his dad. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what I mean. And then when, after a brief illness, the young king passed away in June of 1183, still estranged from his father. William was with him, a friend to the end, and then some. He accompanied the young king's body from where he passed away to where he wanted to be buried and was determined to carry out the young king's deathbed wish. Which brings us to our next awesome point about William Marshall, that he went to Jerusalem. Even though I do not love the idea of medieval crusading, I Mm -hmm. do like the world travel aspect and that he was also connected to this very major historical event. Yes, he was. Here's how it happened. Henry the Young King had, once upon a time, taken a vow to go on crusade. He had never actually done it, though. And according to the biography Kristen talked about at the top of the episode, when the Young King knew his time on this planet was ending, he gave William a cloth cross or cloak and asked him to take it to Jerusalem to help him fulfill his debt to God. William took this request seriously, and with the help of some money from King Henry II, he set out for Jerusalem. Fascinatingly, given all these details that we have about William, and you can already tell that there are so many, there are almost none about his time in and around Jerusalem. The 
incredibly short contextualization for this is that Jerusalem in the later 12th century was part of what are known as the Crusader states, which also included at this time the Principality of Antioch and the County of Edessa. The Crusades were conceived of as a reclamation of an area that was, is, holy to Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And there were a lot of reasons why historians think that medieval European Christians engaged in the crusading movement. And they range from demonstrations of growing papal power, responses to direct requests from the Byzantines, the result of a multitude of religious beliefs, not generally a desire for wealth because crusading was expensive and a lot of people went broke doing it. And once they fulfilled their religious obligations, they went right back home. The city of Jerusalem was captured from the Fatimids in 1099, but that city and that crusader kingdom of Jerusalem were about to fall when William Marshall got there. There were signs that things were not going great for the Christians, but he probably didn't know or maybe was just optimistic that it would hold. And it did while he was there. Jerusalem falls to Saladin in 1187, but William really kind of cut it close. We believe that he did complete his task on behalf of the young king, and we know that he spent almost two years there. But what he did there is really anyone's guess. Uh, many historians have speculated about this, but I'm not comfortable doing that in any depth because this is one of those cases where we really just don't know. But you do really want to know. Yeah, I know, right? Maybe he got involved in the politics of the day. Maybe he had some sort of religious epiphany. And maybe, I mean, well, maybe he just did nothing and he just was waiting for enough time to pass that Henry II back in England would forget he'd assisted the young king during rebellions. I mean, however, we do know that William at least thought a little bit about his own future death while he was there, because when he ultimately passed away many decades later, cloth that he brought back from Jerusalem with him was used for the burial. Also, he displayed a lifelong love of the Templars, a military order of knights whose red cross on a white background you've probably seen in films and i once put on a cake for a medieval event that he possibly and by possibly i mean probably picked up while he was in the holy land since they were a heavy presence there but what fascinates me the most about this period in william's life is how much we don't know even that biographer who had so very much to say about the other events gives us nothing of real worth about this time period Maybe William had a very personal, meaningful experience he didn't want to talk about, or maybe he just made some sort of agreement to never have what happened discussed. We will never know, but we will always wonder. And we will be leaving you to also wonder about this until next time when we return with even more fascinating things about William's life, answering questions like, what happened when he returned to England? Did he ever have a family of his own? Why and how does Ireland get dragged into all this? And here's a fun one. What does William Marshall have in common with the late actor Heath Ledger? I really want to answer them now, but we can't. So please enjoy thinking about William Marshall and Heath Ledger for a bit. Until next time, feel free to let us know your guesses about what went down in Jerusalem. Thank you for joining us for this first part of our fascinating points about William Marshall's journey. If you want to learn more about what we discussed today, or if you want spoilers for next time, you can always find our suggestions for further reading on footnotinghistory.com. And that we are all over social media from Twitter to Instagram and Facebook to YouTube. You can find us anywhere by searching for Footnoting History. We hope you'll join us next time, but until then, remember, the best stories are in the footnotes. <laughs>